Hello, everyone, and welcome to ACP's live remote non-CE offering. I'm Lynn Forney, and I'll be the moderator for today's non-CE course. Today's non-CE topic is Section GG, Impairment Crosswalk and Supporting Clinical Pathways, and it will last approximately 30 minutes. It's now my pleasure to introduce Andre Axt, who will be our presenter today. Andre is a clinical content specialist for ACP um, and is a physical therapist. Take it away, Andre. Thank you, Lynn. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Clinical Corner. My name is Andre Axt, and I'm a clinical content specialist with Accelerated Care Plus. I'm responsible for burst content such as the tip of the month and research article of the month, which are released monthly to ACP partners and posted on social media. I also collaborate with ACP team members in creation of other clinical documents. Today's clinical corner is a little different than the ones that have been done over the past year. Those previously done were on specifically tips of the month and research articles of the month. Today's uh, clinical corner is going to be a little bit different. Um, the title of today's webinar is GG Impairment Crosswalk and Supporting Clinical Pathways. Today, we will review a reference document, uh, which is a compilation of several clinical documents meant to assist therapists in understanding MDS, GG, self-care and mobility items, the possible impairments involved for their patients, and the supporting clinical treatment pathways. This compiled document will be sent to participants after today's live webinar. I am going to now pull up the uh, document. And this is the compiled document. There are 13 uh, documents together. It's a total of 38 pages. And um, first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to orient you to the document, showing you um, which documents are in this uh, reference document and explain a little bit about them. And then I'll go through in a little bit more detail and give a few examples of how this tool can be used for you. So this first uh, document here is uh, MDS Items GG Impairment Crosswalk. If you look at the first column, it goes through specific ADLs. The second column, the self-care um, MDS GG items related to that, if we go down through a few pages, it's not just self-care, it's mobility tasks. So self-care and mobility tasks. Uh, this document is a four page document. When someone has um, limitation in eating, there may be possible impairments that we're going to look at. And so does this person have dysphagia? Is it related to pain in the upper extremity why they can't eat or impaired voluntary movement, weakness, limited range of motion or cognition issue? Um, from this document and list of impairments related to the task that the person is having difficulty with, we can then look at what potential treatments the individual may um, need to have. So this last column gives you options um, of different treatments. Now it's not suggesting one specific treatment. It's really telling you all the things that um, might be done uh, with biophysical agents um, and advanced technologies for your patients. With this document, it does give you right here, um, really reminding you to contact your ACP, CPC, clinical program consultant uh, for additional help or the remote clinical services. Um, their phone numbers here, 800-350-1100 and option two. And they can assist you um, with specific treatment um, that may be needed. Now, the view I have of this up right now, I have the bookmarks. And the reason why I have this column of bookmarks, and I'll take it away when I go through some of the other documents uh, later so that you have a better view on the screen, but what I want you to see is that with these bookmarks, when you use it electronically, um, you can just skip to a specific document that you're interested in. So the next document after the GG impairment crosswalk is going to be 
the underlying impairments, biophysical agent supported clinical pathways. And what this is, is um, several algorithms, decision trees on treatment. So this one specifically for acute pain, it starts with some questions and you go through and it tells you um, what may be appropriate applications for this individual. So for acute pain, um, is the person, uh, is there obvious tissue trauma for the individual uh, associated with this pain? If the answer is no, does the patient need pain relief to better tolerate the entire session of therapy? If the answer is yes, are they taking opioids? Really important here. If they are regularly taking opioids, we may apply TENS, LVPC, IFC, or IFC pre-mod with a sensory um, application for ESTEM. If instead they're getting weaned off of opioids, we may use IFC pre-mod sensory motor, so adding in a motor application. The reason why it's different and if the person is not on opioids at all, we can use motor, motor sensory um, type of stimulation. The reason is that the receptor site that uh, the opioids occupy is mu receptor. It is the same receptor site that is occupied by uh, motor e -stim. So if you use motor e on somebody who is taking opioids regularly, you're not gonna get any additional pain relief. So it's important to know some real specifics behind the applications that you're using. And these decision trees can really help you with that. Here instead, um, if there is obvious tissue trauma and the answer is yes, looking at whether it is the size of a credit card or smaller. And the reason for asking this question is because to use ultrasound for the treatment of pain, you're treating a very small area. And so you wanna make sure that you're not treating too big of an area with your ultrasound treatment. Otherwise you may need to do multiple applications of ultrasound, um, which may be um, difficult or time consuming, um, much more appropriate if it's a large area to use something like diathermy for that treatment. Um, so that is how the decision tree um, works. Uh, for these different impairments. And we'll look at some of the others as we go through. But we also see some bullets at the bottom and they're all very important. Um, anytime you use biophysical agents for your patients, you wanna make sure that you review the complete list of contraindications, warnings, and precautions to make sure that application is appropriate for your specific patient. Uh, we also wanna make sure we're using good infection control procedures, um, making sure that we clean the equipment properly. Um, if we're using intermediate level of infection control, we're actually wiping twice with super sandy wipes and leaving one on the um, piece of equipment and letting it dry. So letting it sit for a few minutes, making sure that we're being cognizant of dwell times so that it really does um, kill and take care of the bacteria and viruses uh, that uh, the product says it is going to. These algorithms give you some treatment options and ideas, but it is not an end all be all. It is not the only um, options. So if you have questions, don't hesitate to call your con clinical program consultant or um, the ACP cl uh, remote clinical services line or email them, and they can help you with um, really troubleshooting what would be best for your patient and most appropriate. The next uh, algorithm here is for chronic pain. So we have it broken down between acute and chronic pain. And you'll notice that these are both green um, because it's both pain. The colors throughout the document are really tied to each other. Um, back to the original document, if you look at pain, pain was green um, in that uh, MDS GG impairment crosswalk. So we looked at acute pain and then we have chronic pain. Um, there's impaired voluntary movement with incoordination. There's impaired voluntary movement with tone. We have muscle weakness. After muscle weakness, we also have 
strength exercise, looking at progressive resistance exercise, a quick reference guide on looking at proper intensity dosing and how to perform those exercises. So it's a good reminder right after the muscle weakness. Then we have limited range of motion, looking at the muscle specifically or limited range of motion, looking at the connective tissues and joint. We then have one related to impaired posture, one related to impaired balance, one for reduced aerobic capacity, reduced aerobic capacity. We have one for um, right after the reduced aerobic capacity, looking at the target heart rate range, looking at the Kerbonin method and being able to um, figure out what range your patient's uh, heart rate should be in during your aerobic exercise, depending on the intensity uh, that you're looking at. We have one for localized edema. We have one for wounds. The next document, so this is still that second document. And if you look at the line, Connecting all of these, you can see it's one document, um, but each little page is bookmarked so that it helps with your ability to navigate through this quickly and efficiently. When we come down here after that, um, those algorithms, decision trees, we have some of the uh, clinical treatment pathways. So first, the pain cl clinical treatment pathway. Um, looking at both acute and chronic pain. In these treatment pathways, these documents are great. They actually list uh, what treatments you would do per day. So looking at day one through eight and then progressing uh, with the patients. It gives a list down this first column of outcome measures. These outcome measures are evidence-based outcome measures for this specific um, impairment, looking at pain uh, for that program. And then looking at what we would do uh, for treating pain. We may use something like uh, subthermal diathermy, ultrasound, or electrical stimulation. Um, if it's uh, to decrease acute pain, we may be looking at subthermal treatments. Um, if we're trying to uh, increase uh, circulation. Again, we're looking at those same treatment applications. We may also look at strength training um, in this population, postural re-education, balance training, gait training, ADLs, cognitive and behavioral training, all depending on how your patient is specifically assessed and what their needs are. Um, but these are specific to the pain management uh, treatment program. This next uh, treatment pathway is for general post-operative lower extremity. Uh, again, we're looking at specific outcome measures for this population and looking at some of the treatments specific uh, for this population that we may be using. The next two documents are um, some specific uh, pathway checklists. So total hip arthroplasty, physical therapy, clinical pathway checklist. This is a great tool to use uh, for documentation with your patient and communication with your colleagues on what treatments you're doing, what treatments you might uh, be progressing them to, um, so that it, uh, you can really communicate well and show what that patient is doing. And then noting if you're having success, you're going to progress that patient. If you're not uh, having success, uh, progress with that patient, you might then go ahead and uh, reassess and see um, how you might uh, alter their current treatment plan. This is the uh, total knee arthroplasty physical therapy clinical pathway checklist. So again, one for knee and one for hip right after the post-op uh, lower extremity treatment pathway. The next pathway we have in this document is the general neural rehab uh, treatment pathway. Again, looking at outcome measures and what biophysical agents may be appropriate, depending on what that clinical presentation is for your individual patient. The next one here is for continence improvement. Um, again, same things, looking at what we're going to do for outcome measures, things like voiding di diaries, um, we may look at mobility with this patient, gait, speed, balance, um, and then doing specific treatments uh, for the individual. 
This is the general fall prevention treatment pathway. Um, some of these treatment pathways, as you scroll through, um, as I scroll down, you'll see it goes from PT, and then OT is the second page. With this, again, looking at some of the specific outcome measures um, that are evidence-based for looking at aerobic capacity, maybe the two or six minute walk test. Um, we might look at gait speed. Uh, we might look at uh, muscle performance using 30 second time sit to stand. We will look at strengthening, range of motion, uh, postural re-education, balance training, transfer training, and gait training. Again, all depending on that specific patient's clinical presentation. The next uh, document is related to that fall prevention imbalance clinical program. And this is a fall prevention ADL assessment. In this document, you look down the left, they have ADLs of supine to sit, sit to stand, standing, stairs ascending and descending, gait, looking at specific components of the gait cycle. With this, we'll look at specifically, say, um, sit to stand. The patient is having difficulty with sit to stand. Why? Maybe they can't get their feet underneath the chair. Well, what is that due to? Is it due to muscle weakness? See that in the next column? You then look at, is it concentric hamstring strength or is it concentric tibialis anterior strength. Um, so they can't dorsiflex the feet to get the feet back and underneath the chair. Um, looking at limited range of motion, their knees at 100 degrees. It isn't at 90 or even past 90 to really be able to properly perform that sit to stand. So that's gonna limit that. So with this document, we're looking at specific ADLs and what that clinical presentation is, and then looking at what uh, impairment may be specifically related to that. The next treatment pathway in this document is the general cardiopulmonary treatment pathway. Um, again, set up as the others, same thing, looking at um, the days of treatment, looking at specific outcome measures, and what would be appropriate for that program, some specific treatments uh, for the individual. In the cardiopulmonary program, we may use things like pens, we may use um, aerobic exercise, may uh, include the omni cycle with that. We may do strength uh, training, breathing exercises, balance training, transfer training, gait training. Um, all of these things may be appropriate for this population. The next one is uh, for wound healing treatment pathway. And this uh, first page includes diabetic ischemic and pressure ulcers. And then we also have one for venous insufficiency. So looking at again, how we'll assess that patient, um, what may be appropriate for the biophysical agents in the treatment, and what other items we might be doing with that individual, so depending on their presentation. And this one is for venous insufficiency ulcers. So again, all of these documents can work well together um, and be a helpful tool for you. I'm now gonna go back up to the top of this document and go back to the GG impairment and go through that document and then go to some other specifics um, within that. I'm gonna um, give another view of this so that you can see it a little bit better. I may have to toggle back um, so because of these bookmarks are very helpful in the navigation uh, for us. So this view um, is a little bit better, bigger and clearer for you. So I'm gonna use this to go through this document and then I may bounce back to the other one a little bit uh, as we navigate. So the first thing again, this is the GG impairment crosswalk. So what we look at for the self-care items, uh, we have eating here um, as the first one, then oral hygiene um, and toileting. And on the next document, we have um, for self-care, showering, bathing yourself. And then we have upper body dressing, lower body dressing, and putting on and removing footwear. Now we have the mobility tests, looking at rolling left to right, sitting to lying, lying to sitting on the side of the bed. Um, we have sit to stand chair to bed, um, bed to chair, toilet transfers, car transfers, 
and picking up objects. Now you'll notice with the letters here, they are related specifically to those um, GG items. Um, in making this document, we actually grouped them specifically depending on um, what was indicated. So you'll notice picking up objects from the floor is actually labeled P, but it works with this because in all of these, you're really looking at the same movements of like sit to stand or standing to squatting and then standing back up. So all of this really related. The next section here, looking at walking 10 feet, walking 50 feet with two turns, walking 150 feet and walking 10 feet on uneven surfaces. The next page has um, going up one step, like a curb, four steps, 12 steps, and then the last one on wheelchair mobility, wheeling 50 feet with two turns or wheeling 150 feet. So this document, I'm gonna go back to the beginning. We're gonna go through one of these items a little bit more uh, specifically. So here, if the person has difficulty with bathing themselves, we may look at specifically what impairments are related. Maybe this person has pain, shoulder pain specifically. So upper extremity pain, we may use ultrasound, shortwave diathermy, either subthermal or thermal, typically depending on whether it's acute or chronic. If it's acute, we're gonna to wanna to use something um, that is not going to inflame that area. So we're not gonna put heat into it. We'll do subthermal and then we'll do thermal if it's a chronic, chronic uh, condition. We may use IFC, LVPC, sensory motor, motor sensory nerve block or pens. So this document's really tying these items together. But when we go into the next document, and I'm just going to scroll through this way to be able to get to it for you guys so you can see this in a big view, um, we could go to acute pain. The person has acute shoulder pain, and we can look at this decision tree and then use that specifically. So again, back to this document, um, we're going to use this document and then go into those decision trees uh, specifically. After the decision tree, we would go down. And again, if I was using the other view, which I'm really going to do because it's going to be a little bit easier for you to see this. So I can go from this GG document and decide that it's pain. I can go to acute pain here and look at the decision tree. I can then scroll down past this decision tree document and I can go straight to the pain treatment pathway. So this way you can use all of these documents together. Um, pretty quickly and efficiently uh, for yourself. When we go back and instead of doing um, that self-care item, let's look at a, a little bit different one. So instead, let's look at something in the lower extremity, sit to stand pretty quick and easily. So sit to stand uh, for this individual. Maybe the reason uh, why they're having difficulty with sit to stand is poor aerobic capacity. So due to poor aerobic capacity, maybe PENS, OmniCycle, OmniStand, or OmniVR would be appropriate treatments uh, for this individual. So instead, we're going to then look at in the next document, we'll go down the side and we are going to look for reduced aerobic capacity. Is the reduced aerobic capacity partially due to muscle weakness? Yes we're gonna to refer to the muscle weakness clinical pathway because we're gonna to wanna to address that muscle weakness. Once we address the muscle weakness, then we would go ahead and do this. If it's not due to muscle weakness specifically, we're gonna have the patient perform aerobic exercise three times a week within the target heart rate range using the heart rate reserve formula. We're gonna to refer to that reference guide, which is next in this application. We're going to monitor vitals and document those vitals. We're going to apply PENS, functional electrical uh, cycling, e-STEM protocol. We can um, do PENS, functional walk e-STEM protocol. We can do that during uh, gait training three times a week. Now, the next document is that target heart rate range. So you can look at this target heart rate and figure that out. Uh, real simply, we want the person to exercise with a specific intensity. We use the target heart rate to help them really determine what that heart rate is. So if you want the person to um, exercise at a moderate intensity at 40 to 60%, 
we're going to use this formula. The formula real simply is 220 minus the patient's age. We're then going to uh, look at the figure that you get. We're going to minus the resting heart rate. We're accounting for resting heart rate in the Carvonin method. We're going to then multiply that figure to, by the intensities that you're looking at. So if you want the person to exercise between 40 and 60%, you can do 220 minus, say, their 80-year-old patient with a heart rate of 60 beats per minute. 220 minus 85 is 135. That 135 minus the 60 beats per minute for resting heart rate, rate equals 75. We're going to multiply that by 0.4 and by 0.6. We're going to take that figure and we're going to add it back in to those two figures and add them back into the resting heart rate. So 30 plus the 60 equals 90 and 45 plus the 60 equals 105. So you want that individual to exercise between 90 and 105 beats per minute and you'll monitor uh, your heart rate. Again, we can refer to um, CPCs uh, when you have questions and the aerobic exercise uh, course also can be helpful um, for the treatment here. So this is really a look at how compilation of uh, ACP clinical documents can be used to assist you um, in the treatment of your patients, deciding what uh, potential impairments are involved in, related to the GG items and what treatments um, would be most appropriate for your patients. Again, if you have any questions, um, don't hesitate to contact Remote Clinical Services or uh, your clinical program consultant and refer to um, contraindications, warnings, and precautions for the use of any biophysical agents and using infection control properly. Uh, this concludes today's uh, content portion for this webinar. Yes, thank you all for joining us and have a good day.